Real quick, before we get into today's video, I wanted to talk about my secondary channel, Archive64. For the past year or so, I've been uploading high-quality playthroughs of a variety of games without commentary. When making videos, it can be difficult to find good footage to use for editing, and this is why I decided to start this channel. Not only is it for people who just simply want to enjoy watching commentary-free playthroughs of games, but it's also for those who want to start making content of their own without worrying about where to get the footage or having to record it themselves. I plan to eventually do playthroughs of every Zelda game in the series, with the current project being Ocarina of Time 3D. However, as of now, there's full 100% playthroughs of Spirit Tracks, Phantom Hourglass, Skyward Sword HD, Wind Waker HD, and Minish Cap. But I'm also uploading footage for other games, whether it be Horizon Forbidden West, or one of my favorites, Slime Rancher. They look so freaking adorable! I already have a ton of footage stockpiled for other projects not yet released, including Stardew Valley, Terraria Master Mode, LEGO City Undercover, and the Pokémon series. In fact, one of the bigger playthroughs I'm working on at the moment is a 100% Pokédex completion playthrough of Legends Arceus. Anyone who's looking for footage is free to use this in their own videos, and credit isn't required, although appreciated. I'll have a link to the channel below, so feel free to check it out if you're interested. And now, back to today's video. Often, we're only told a fraction of the overall narrative when it comes to games in the Zelda series. Key details are either lost to history with the passage of time, or rewritten by those who wish to conceal the truth. Whether it be the residents of Skyloft who remain blissfully ignorant of the surface below, or the events which led up to the Great Flood of Wind Waker. And who can forget the most recent installment into the franchise, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. While much is known about what transpired a hundred years ago, the same can't be said for the events predating the creation of Sheikah technology used to defeat Calamity Ganon. In fact, one of the most discussed topics regarding its sequel is the mysterious tribe responsible for the numerous ruins scattered across Hyrule. A group which, according to legend, suddenly disappeared thousands of years ago. Were they simply forgotten due to the passage of time, or was their disappearance due to more sinister reasons? a tribe written out of the history books by those in power as an attempt to hide something or someone. Often it's said that history is written by the victors, we're only ever given a single perspective of events, regardless of how accurate it is. But the truth always has a way of rearing its ugly head. The more one tries to hide something, the more likely it is to come to light. Or in this case, shadow. Our investigation begins to the west of Hyrule Field, in a small quaint village at the foot of Death Mountain. Once home to the mysterious Sheikah tribe, this location now acts as a humble settlement opened up to the poor folk of Hyrule Kingdom. But looks can be deceiving. What appears to be an innocent village holds a dark secret. One that is considered to be a taboo subject among the royal family. Directly behind the village's graveyard is an elevated platform, seemingly cut off from the rest of the area. Inside the dimly lit tunnel, a central chamber with a sealed door. When this entrance was sealed is unknown, but one thing is clear, visitors are clearly not welcome here. Eventually, this entrance would be opened by the Hero of Time, giving him access to the Seventh Temple, and with it, all the horrific secrets this place had to offer. The Shadow Temple consists of numerous chambers filled with traps and undead creatures. Guillotines, moving saw blades, rotating statues equipped with deadly scythes, and falling platforms covered in spikes. It's no wonder that the royal family wiped this place from the kingdom's history. Knowing that such a place existed would be enough to make someone's stomach churn. Judging from the bloodstains and rooms built out of human remains, it's clear that many lost their lives here, with multiple jail cells throughout the dungeon and crypts left undisturbed for time immemorial. Perhaps this is why the Shadow Temple is filled with undead creatures. They're the restless souls of people who fell victim to both the dungeon itself and whoever was responsible for it. 
According to the Hyrule Encyclopedia, the Shadow Temple was a place used by the Sheikah to interrogate enemies of the royal family. While it is rather vague with the description, it's not hard to believe that the prisoners held here were frequently tortured and even executed. The passage goes on to say that, because of its dark history, the Shadow Temple is considered a taboo subject. While the Hyrulean royal family is responsible for keeping the peace, along with the protection of the Triforce in some cases, they're by no means perfect. In fact, many times it's their foolish decisions which lead to the destruction of the kingdom, the excavation of Sheikah technology which Calamity Ganon takes over, or misplaced trust in two individuals who later bring ruin to the land. As stated in the book, the Shadow Temple may very well be yet another one of the royal family's mistakes. To be perfectly honest, there are a lot of things about this temple which are viewed as absolute truths, which technically aren't as black and white as they seem. This video will cover a variety of popular theories regarding the Shadow Temple, as well as my own thoughts and ideas. When researching for this video, one of the first things that stood out to me was the timeline of events and how it relates to Bongo Bongo Seal. The entity is first encountered at Kakariko Village, where it emerges from the well and attacks both Sheik and the player. We're given more information about Bongo Bongo immediately after this encounter. As always, we'll be looking at the Japanese translations. Blink. A very unusual thing has happened. The dark monster has resurrected. That dark monster was sealed at the bottom of the well by the power of Impa, the leader of Kakariko Village. But that monster's power grew too strong and, with the well seal broken, it has now appeared above ground. Impa must have gone to the Temple of Darkness to face it and seal it once more, but as things are now, she's in danger. Given this information, we know that prior to this encounter with the Shadow Beast, Bongo Bongo was sealed deep beneath the well. This same location is visited by a young hero of time in search of the Lens of Truth, and acts as a sort of mini-dungeon. However, when you think about it from a story perspective, it's rather odd that Link would find himself in an area which, according to the lore, is currently holding a powerful monster. If Bongo Bongo was sealed up prior to the hero's departure into the well, you'd think that there would be some signs of its presence especially since entering this place could bring about some risks of potentially breaking the seal put on this entity. Remember that it was Impa who sealed the monster, someone who is present in both the past and future. If Bongo Bongo really was sealed then, you'd think that people would have been talking about it, and even warning the hero to stay far away from the well. Because of this, I believe that Bongo Bongo was sealed inside of the well sometime during the seven year gap that happens once Link obtains the Master Sword and opens up the Sacred Realm to Ganondorf. This also raises the question of where he was before his confinement within the well, and whether he even existed at this point, a topic I'll go into more later in this video. Now, this is the part where things get rather… strange. As previously established, once Bongo Bongo broke free from beneath the well, Impa traveled to the Shadow Temple in an attempt to seal the creature. A seal which supposedly breaks in the cutscene before this dialogue, as we see the village on fire in the background, as well as a nearby structure being ripped from its foundation and hurled into the air, only for a dark shadow to emerge from the well and attack Link. So... what's the problem here? It comes from something said by an NPC in Impa's house. This house is Lady Impa's house. She headed out to the graveyard to seal a monster. Since monsters are running loose ever since Ganondorf showed up, the peace of this village is protected by Lady Impa. Speaking of which, Lady Impa hasn't come back yet. Did something happen to her? It's safe to assume that the events referenced here are the very same as the ones mentioned by Sheik. Both are describing the events following the resurrection of Bongo Bongo. The problem with this dialogue isn't what's said, but when it's said. The player can encounter this NPC as soon as visiting Kakariko Village for the first time as an adult, and yes, he says the same thing. Assuming that this isn't a mistake by the developers, it means that by the time Link awakens from his seven year slumber, the seal on the well has already been broken. One thing which solidifies this idea is how the player doesn't encounter Impa until after completing the Shadow Temple. And when you think about it, this would be a pretty huge oversight on behalf of the game devs. It's definitely not a translation error, as the quote referenced comes directly from the Japanese version of the game. 
To me, this discovery is incredibly weird since I've always assumed that the seal on the well was broken in the cutscene. And it means that, even after breaking said seal, Bongo Bongo chose to stay inside of the well for… reasons? One possibility is that, similar to Skyward Sword, Bongo Bongo emerged from the well as a response to the sacred power of the Master Sword. In the former, the Imprisoned breaks its seal right before Link is about to strike the deactivated Gate of Time with the Master Sword. It's a bit of a coincidence that Demise chooses to appear now, which Impa theorizes is a reaction to the Blade's sacred power. So the same could be said with Bongo Bongo, except in this case the seal was already broken. So, let's talk a bit more about Bongo Bongo himself. All we know about its origins is that it was, at some point, sealed in the well by Impa. Because there are a multitude of theories surrounding this topic, we're going to cover some of the more prominent ones, as well as my own thoughts on the matter. First, to answer the question of Bongo Bongo's whereabouts prior to the seal beneath the well. Regardless of how this entity came into being, I think it's safe to say that it was born in the Shadow Temple. According to Raru, Ganondorf's evil power radiated from the temples of Hyrule once he obtained the Triforce, transforming Hyrule into a world of monsters. As Link travels to each location, he must rid the temples of their curses so that the sages awaken to their power, these curses taking the forms of powerful monsters. Something which makes sense as Ganondorf's power would have likely been greatest at the temples, since this quote suggests them to be the source of all monsters. Going off from this bit of information, the simplest explanation to give regarding Bongo Bongo's origins is that it was a demon created by Ganondorf after he broke into the Sacred Realm and got his hands on the Triforce of Power, with one of the biggest pieces of evidence supporting this theory coming from what we've already discussed regarding the Gerudo Kane and his evil powers. However, it's also worth noting that while Ganondorf's power is the reason these powerful beings plague the temples in the present day, their origins is a different matter altogether. The two best examples of this are the Spirit and Fire Temples. The former's boss was Twin Rova, who, according to the lore, are Ganondorf's surrogate mothers, a pair of witches we see in both the past and future. And then there's Volvagia, said to be an ancient dragon which lived in the heart of Death Mountain. According to legend, it was defeated by a Goron wielding the Megaton Hammer. This creature is later revived by Ganondorf, acting as the boss of the Fire Temple. So we know that this dragon existed long before Ganondorf's invasion of the Sacred Realm. Because of this, it's hard to say with definitive proof whether Bongo Bongo was created by Ganondorf or had already existed in the Shadow Temple prior to the Demon King's rise in power. And now, it's time to look deeper into that second possibility. Perhaps Bongo Bongo was once a deity, now corrupted by the dark powers of Ganondorf. In the past, we've had several dungeon bosses act as guardians of sacred locations, including Godin from Tower of the Gods and Mazal from the Fortress of Winds. One can't help but notice the similarities between each boss, as many of these guardians tend to be ahead with disembodied hands. Now, admittedly, there isn't much evidence to this theory. However, in both the Shadow Temple and Beneath the Well are wall statues of a creature who almost looks like he's imprisoned in a pillory or guillotine. A lot of people have already pointed out how Bongo Bongo's appearance resembles a person who's had their hands and head cut off. Now, this whole theory depends on whether you consider Bongo Bongo's eye to be his actual head or not. It also is possible that this is the boss's true face, but I'm not entirely sure. But what's by far the most popular theory is that Bongo Bongo was once a villager residing in Kakariko Village. Shikashi tells us that long ago there was a man who had an eye that could see the truth. According to the old man, normally this is something you'd have to train your mind's eye strenuously to do, but this person had a different way of doing things, and that his house once stood where the well is now. It's very likely that this individual was the previous owner of the Lens of Truth. Whether he himself created it or stumbled across it is unknown, but there's an overwhelming amount of evidence to suggest that the two are connected. The Japanese version also refers to this item as the Lens of Truth, and translations of Shikashi's quote retain the phrasing of seeing or ascertaining the truth. Second is that this person's house once stood where the well is, and beneath the well is where a young hero of time finds the relic. 
The Lens of Truth is one of many Sheikah artifacts meant to give normal folk the power of the Sheikah, a third eye if you will. Even the design itself resembles a Sheikah eye. This wording also suggests that the previous owner of the Lens of Truth wasn't a Sheikah, but I'm not entirely sure if this truly was the case. Remember that Kakariko Village used to be a Sheikah settlement, and was only recently opened up to the common folk. But on the other hand, a Sheikah wouldn't need this relic since its whole purpose is to give one the powers of the Sheikah. So perhaps this person really did create the Lens of Truth, but it's not impossible for this person to have been a Sheikah since, after all, you'd probably need a Sheikah to craft this sort of item. On the other hand, Shikashi's statement also suggests that anyone can gain the powers of the Sheikah through strenuous training of the mind's eye. One of the guards stationed at Gerudo Valley tells Link of the two riddles of the desert. In order to cross the haunted wasteland, the player needs the Eye of Truth. As we later find out, this is referring to the Lens of Truth since it's needed to see the Phantom Guide. Either the Gerudo know of the Lens of Truth's existence, or this proves that anyone can train their mind's eye to see the unseen. After all, how else could they have gotten through the desert? Actually, this leads into another interesting idea that I just thought of. Perhaps the Phantom Guide was actually a Sheikah who could guide the Gerudo, and maybe the Gerudo like, threatened the, the, the person and they killed them after they got through the desert. Would explain why the, the Phantom Guide helps the hero. I don't know, just a random thing to think of. <laughs> On another note, it's interesting to think that this item could have instead been the Mask of Truth. I will admit that it's way more likely to be the former since it's found beneath the well, which was once the same location as the man's house, but the mask is said to have been passed down by the Sheikah, has an eye on the front of it, and the powers to see into people's hearts and minds. In a way, it lets the user see the truth. With that said, while the localization does refer to it as the Mask of Truth, Translations from the Japanese version use the phrasing, A Mask of Truth, which implies that more than one of this item exists. Another reason why Shikashi is likely referring to the Lens of Truth here. <sighs> so, why do people believe that this man is the shadow fought at the temple? I think it mostly comes down to the fact that the Lens of Truth plays a huge factor in navigating the temple and its boss fight. There's also the detail about the man's house being where the well now stands, a place which acted as a sealing grounds for Bongo Bongo. And that's about it. The rest of this theory usually leads into a what-if scenario. Like, perhaps this Sheikah wronged the others and it led to his execution, but that's the overall gist of it. If there were more evidence, then I'd be inclined to agree. However, as it stands, Bongo Bongo being the man that can see the truth is not as solid of a theory that people make it out to be. Personally speaking, I believe that the Shadow Monster's origins are way more connected to the Shadow Temple itself rather than Kakariko Village. If this place was used to torture and execute enemies of the royal family, as stated by Hyrule Encyclopedia, Perhaps Bongo Bongo is an accumulation of poor souls who lost their lives at the hands of the Sheikah, or to be more specific, the ones who were pulling the strings behind the scenes, the royal family of Hyrule. Even if we don't consider what's written in this book, the Shadow Temple is filled with blood splatter, jail cells, and equipment meant for execution and torture. Plus, you know, the hundreds of dead bodies throughout the dungeon. One of the key details to remember here is that anyone deemed an enemy in the eyes of the royal family would be punished, regardless of their actual crimes. Even someone who's simply vocal about their doubt or dislike of Hyrule's monarchy would be an easy target, especially since the servants of the royal family are the Sheikah, a race known for their ninja-like skills. In fact, it's entirely plausible that this would have occurred during the Hyrulean Civil War, the same war we're told about by the Deku Tree Sprout. However, there's nothing in the game that suggests that this has to be that same war. The events taking place within the Shadow Temple may have been during a completely different war altogether. Now, we already know that the Zelda series takes much inspiration from Japanese folklore and culture, one of the best examples being the substance known as Malice. Malice quite literally being another word for hatred. Those who die with intense feelings of hatred or anger reanimate after death, such as Skyward Sword's Cursed Bokoblin. Another recurring enemy in the series is the Poe, who according to the Poe Collector are spirits of concentrated hatred, very similar to the Yurei of Japanese folklore. Yurei are born from those who pass away through sudden or violent means, 
if the proper rites haven't been performed, or if they are influenced by powerful emotions, desire for revenge, sorrow, and yes, even hatred. Most of the monsters we see in the Shadow Temple are undead creatures, ones which have seemingly come back from the dead. Redeads, Gibdos, Stalfos, and who can forget the infamous Dead Hand? If these unrest souls were to accumulate, it could very well be the origin story of Bongo Bongo himself, perhaps even explain why he went after Kakariko Village after escaping his seal. There's a sort of poetic justice to it, since the brutal actions taken by the royal family and their followers would have come back to haunt them, quite literally. You know, for a video all about the Shadow Temple, it's sure taken a long time to get to analyzing the temple itself. Well, I suppose that's only half true. We have been talking about it throughout this video, though up until now, the central focus has been on Bongo Bongo. Up until now, we've rolled with the idea of the Shadow Temple being solely used as a torture and execution chamber, but let's quickly look at some other possibilities. The first is that the Shadow Temple was actually used by Ganondorf during his Reign of Terror as a means of torturing and imprisoning those who rebelled against him. There are examples of this in the game, such as how he feeds the Gorons to Volvagia to instill fear in others. And we know that the Gerudo already have some connections to the Lens of Truth, or the concept of ascertaining the truth. But in my opinion, this idea seems unlikely at best. After all, why would there be a peaceful village right beside the place used by Ganondorf to torture those who defy him? It's also possible that this was a sort of training ground for the Sheikah. When you think about it, the placement of certain traps and guillotines seems very strange if they were meant for torture and execution. Not to mention that some of them are only visible with the lens of truth. In fact, this one detail could mean that the Shadow Temple was the strenuous training mentioned by Shikashi. Having an arena filled with traps only seen with one's third eye would make sense if that training was related to seeing the unseen. It's true that the Shika were gifted with Hylia's sight, but that doesn't mean no training would be required. This idea would also add credibility to the thought of the Lens of Truth being used by someone who wished to gain the power without putting in the effort. Another theory is that the temple may have been made to absorb and concentrate all the evil within Hyrule. I've always thought it strange that a sacred temple was used to torture and execute people, which makes this explanation feel more plausible. And who can forget the famous quote often referenced in Zelda videos? The Japanese version isn't so different, mentioning a dark history of desire and malice. Oh, and that's another interesting bit. Instead of being called the Shadow Temple, it's the Temple of Darkness. Now, if this Temple of Darkness was built to hold all of Hyrule's evil and malice, in a way it's similar to the purpose of the Ancient Cistern, temples solely built for purification purposes. The bottom of a cistern is filled with undead creatures and other evil, yet the top half is a serene paradise, clear waters and an atmosphere which contrasts the underground portion. But if this was the case, then what of the execution equipment? It could have been added to deal with the inevitable monster spawns, but there's still the torture equipment and jail cells. And there's one key detail we've yet to mention, that being the massive fairy-like boat at the end of the temple. At this point, my personal headcanon was that the Shadow Temple was once a sacred temple, later desecrated by the royal family for their own personal gain. It was transformed into an execution and torture chamber, used by the Sheikah to deal with those who were deemed enemies of Hyrule's monarchy. But there's one bit of evidence which felt out of place, found at the Forest Temple. In the corridor, just before the boss chamber, are several paintings. I remember coming across these when working on my Phantom Ganon theory, and at the time I didn't know what they were supposed to be of. But thanks to the user Ninoctero, we may know the answer to two of them. One is of the Temple of Time and its image being reflected in the water, and then there's this one. It's hard to make out at first, but once you see that lawn strake of red down the middle, it becomes more obvious. It's likely that this is a painting of the fairy within the Shadow Temple, more specifically the figure carved into the front of it. 
If this place wasn't always used as an execution chamber, why would a picture of this boat be found within the forest temple? It would mean that this ferry was around at the time of that temple's creation, and obviously this boat is meant to be connected to death. Perhaps this means that the Shadow Temple's original purpose was to send off the departed souls of the royal family. It makes sense since this dungeon does have ties to the Sheikah, who we know are servants of the royal family, and their village is close by. The golden bracelets around the arms are also reminiscent of the ones worn by Breath of the Wild Sheikah monks, who also have a mummified sort of appearance. Once again though, there's a problem. A massive problem. Both the Forest Temple's paintings and fairy design are exclusive to the 3DS version. In the original game, these paintings aren't present, and the design of the fairy in the Shadow Temple is completely different, instead being of the same figure seen throughout the temple. The reason this is an issue is because whether details from the 3DS version can truly be viewed as canon or not is unknown. But I never said that that was all the evidence there is. In fact, that evidence is the evidence exclusive to the 3DS version. Because on the deck of the ferry, in both the 3DS and N64 version, is a Triforce crest. One of many locations where the hero must play Zelda's lullaby, a song passed down by the royal family. By doing this, the ferry will start moving across the river. If we are to believe that this vessel was involved in some sort of ceremony for the departed souls of the royal family, this detail makes a whole lot of sense. In addition, the graves for the royal families of Hyrule can be found in one location, that being Kakariko Village, directly outside of the Shadow Temple's entrance. And that's not all. There's more information regarding the ferry trip itself worth discussing. It's reminiscent of the Styx in Greek mythology, said to be a river of the underworld. It's said that the river Styx acted as a boundary between the underworld and Earth, so when the player rides this ferry, it's literally traversing between the realms of life and death. The icing on the cake? Japanese translations directly reference the ferry's trip into Hades slash Underworld. Now, that sounds quite ominous. I mean, why would the royal family's souls be sent to hell? Well, in Greek mythology, the Underworld represents the afterlife as a whole, which includes both heaven and hell. Going back to the bit on the Yurei, one cause of their creation is if proper rites aren't performed correctly. So that could very well be a reason why the Sheikah did a ceremony like send-off for the deceased members of the royal family. It was to make sure that none came back as a Yurei. Another detail which may point to this is Sheik's statement, where the legend of the temples refers to the Shadow Temple as a house of the dead. Now, even with this explanation, there's still a lot of bizarre things found within the temple. One of the first details which sticks out is the quote at the very beginning. The shadow will yield only to one with the Eye of Truth, handed down in Kakariko Village. Some believe that the shadow referenced here is referring to an individual person, perhaps it's a sort of title or codename. If they were talking about normal shadows, this phrasing comes off as rather strange. However, if we once again look at the Japanese translations for this quote, there's no mention of a shadow. In fact, the beginning is completely different altogether. Next are the bird-like figures scattered across the Shadow Temple. The pointy ears and long beak give it a very sinister look. The first thing that comes to mind is its similarity to Anubis, a jackal-headed deity whose job was to guide souls into the afterlife. He was also involved in another ceremony where the deceased's heart was placed on one side of a scale with the other holding a feather. This determined whether the soul could enter the realm of the dead or instead be devoured by Amit. The biggest issue here comes from the fact that the former's design is clearly based off of a bird while Anubis always takes on a canine appearance. But just by looking at the proportions, there's clearly some similarities here. Many depictions of Anubis have elongated mouths and long pointy ears, which also happens to be true for the bird statues. So the game developers may have taken inspiration from Anubis' design while making these statues. The real kicker is that Anubis is actually the Greek form of the Egyptian word Anpu, meaning to decay. Quite interesting since we went over the previous connections to Greek mythology. Also, remember how I said the design of the ship is completely different in the N64 version? 
In the original, the design of the front of the ship is one of these bird statues, with another one on a wall further up the chamber. Almost as if Anubis himself is guiding the souls to the afterlife. Another type of statue is also present in the Shadow Temple's biggest chamber, that being the rat figures. There's not nearly as much to go off of, but when looking into the significance of rats, I came up with a couple possibilities. The first is quite obvious, rats tend to be associated with filth or uncleansliness, a description rather fitting for a sacred temple now used to commit atrocities. Second is that rats often represent greed and or thievery. Judging from what's said near the beginning of the Shadow Temple, it being a place of desire and malice, this aligns quite well with that interpretation. And we actually have a perfect example of this in The Wind Waker, where the rats can sometimes steal Link's rupees, and will even share some of their spoils to the hero when given some bait. In fact, rats are reoccurring enemies in the Zelda series, making the existence of rat statues in the Shadow Temple a lot more believable. Lastly, there's the sinister looking paintings found all throughout the dungeon. These also appear in the original, but the 3DS version gives us a lot more detail to work with. Unfortunately, this is still an unsolved mystery for me. The only observations I made from this are 1. It has a prankster sort of look, 2. These paintings have the ability to speak and give the hero clues, and 3. Whatever this figure is, it appears to have a third eye, which makes sense given the whole mind's eye thing. It connects this figure to the Sheikah, who tend to have their emblem painted on their forehead. There's actually a 3D model of this painting in Majora's Mask 3D, and you can clearly see that the third eye is part of the face. But this is definitely the most puzzling part of the temple. We could give a possible answer as to what it means, but that would likely be reaching into heavy speculation territory. One thing I will speculate on is the possibility of the man who could see the truth being this entity we speak to in the temple. It has to be someone who knows the ins and outs of the Shadow Temple, as well as the lens of truth technology. Perhaps it's his spirit guiding the Hero of Time through the dungeon. Plus, these same paintings are present in the area beneath the well, which at one time would have been connected to his house. Speaking of beneath the well... I can't believe it's taken this long to get to the bit about the area beneath the well. Just how long is this video going to be? Half an hour? Luckily, we've already gone through the majority of information, and since this is a mini dungeon, it won't be nearly as long as the previous segment. But there are some very interesting things to talk about regarding this place. One is how much of what's seen in the Shadow Temple also makes an appearance at the bottom of the well. The creepy paintings, prison cells, chambers resembling crypts, the head and hands of an imprisoned figure on the wall, the sinister looking skull torches, even the bird-like figure towering over numerous coffins. The enemies here are also similar to the Shadow Temple, including Dead Hand, a monster only appearing in both locations. Because of this, it's plausible that at one point, the area beneath the well was part of the Shadow Temple itself. Or perhaps it was meant to connect to the temple, but production was halted due to reasons unknown. Overlaying the dungeon map over Kakariko Village reveals that the location beneath the well would be directly below the Kakariko Graveyard. I did the same thing for the Shadow Temple, and there is one room which sticks out since it too is under the graveyard. When you look at the map, this room does sort of feel out of the way compared to the rest of the temple. It also happens to be filled with cells similar to the ones found at the bottom of the well, so perhaps at one point it was meant to be connected to the mini-dungeon. It's more speculation than anything since maps aren't the most reliable pieces of evidence, but at the very least it's clear that both would be somewhat close to each other. And since the well acts as an entrance to the mini-dungeon, the connections to the ancient cistern make even more sense here as we do see water flowing through the place. I mean, unless the residents are drinking unfiltered corpse juice, that does not sound appetizing. In my opinion, one of the most interesting things about the bottom of the well is that, since it was once where the man who could see the truth's house was, it means that there was likely a secret passage leading to the area under the well inside his house. You could even consider this his basement, and the Lens of Truth was found here. 
If this place was meant to be an extension to the Shadow Temple, maybe it was built to give the Sheikah a more subtle way of entering the place to quote-unquote deal with the royal family's enemies. It's a lot less suspicious than dragging a purse into the back of the graveyard and vanishing without a trace. Again, this is a mystery which leads more into speculation, but that also happens to be what the next chapter is all about. So, to recap, I believe that the Shadow Temple was once used by the Sheikah to send off the souls of the royal family into the afterlife. This sacred place was later desecrated by the royal family and used to execute and torture their enemies, something that may have happened during the Hyrulean Civil War. Eventually, this temple was abandoned and sealed off, while over time the unrest souls came back in the form of Yure as a means of revenge. This also led to the creation of Bongo Bongo, an accumulation of hatred and malice which would eventually break out during Ganondorf's reign, be sealed once again in the well, then break out once more and flee back to the Shadow Temple, only to be defeated by the Hero of Time. Now, to finish off this video with stuff that's a bit more speculative. First, what is the real story with the man who could see the truth and the lens of truth? Well, I think a simple answer to that is that the Lens of Truth was made for quote-unquote emergency purposes. Remember that it's only the Sheikah who are gifted with the sight of Goddess Hylia and see the Unseen. Adding invisible platforms and hazards to the Shadow Temple was just a way to keep outsiders away, especially if this place was once used for rites and ceremonies. If something bad were to happen and no Sheikah were present, it could let anyone see these traps and navigate the dungeon. Even if that's not the case, members of the royal family would certainly need this item, as we've already established their involvement with the Shadow Temple. It might be a Sheikah-themed dungeon, but it's important to remember that the Sheikah served the royal family. Of course, this is only one of many explanations. It could have been made to gain the powers of the Sheikah without putting in the effort or strenuously training the mind's eye, but that depends on your perspective of the situation. Regarding the sealing of the Shadow Temple, it may have been done to protect the royal family's reputation, or because they sensed the increase of malice in Bongo Bongo, or maybe even a bit of both. I find it fascinating how there's a ritual-like circle at the entrance of the temple, which also requires the use of magic to open. It almost feels like it was put there not to necessarily keep the door shut, but also act as a literal seal on the temple, preventing Bongo Bongo's escape. In fact, there are translations for the Hylian script on the magic circle which says, pray here and use the medallion, more evidence showing that at one time the medallions themselves were going to be usable items. It's very likely that using the fire medallion would have activated Din's fire. This could also be why the house was replaced with the well. It was so the entrance to the basement portion would be hidden from the public, assuming that it was meant to be part of the Shadow Temple. I mean, even that place has its share of corpses and undead creatures. While my headcanon suggests that Ganondorf didn't create Bongo Bongo, it's not hard to imagine that his rise in power may have influenced the magnitude of dark forces sealed within the Shadow Temple, eventually letting Bongo Bongo break out and later be sealed beneath the well. There's one more idea I have, and I've purposely left it until the end of the video because it feels more like speculation. Under the well, at the bottom-most layer, is a green substance. It's never explained what this is, but the same liquid is found in the boss chamber of the Shadow Temple. And this liquid flows outward from Bongo Bongo's boss platform. What if he's the source of this substance? Perhaps it's what allows the dead to come back to life. In fact, you can see a bunch of hands rising from the surface of the pool of liquid beneath the well. It sort of makes me think of the hands in the Dead Hand battles. Perhaps these corpses are slowly coming back to life thanks to this green liquid. What's even more interesting is that this substance is also found in the royal family's tomb, where there are also re-deads. Perhaps this fluid has been slowly flowing out of the Shadow Temple into places such as the bottom of the well and royal family's tomb, leading to the rise of the undead. It would also give us a chronological order of events since both locations are visited by a young Link, meaning that at the time, Bongo Bongo already existed. I also wonder if, perhaps the royal family knew of this and was trying to find a cure. There's one thing about that Sun Son that has always bothered me. 
Not only can it pass time, but for some reason it also freezes Rededs and Gibdos. The stone tablet Link reads even says, give peaceful rest to the living dead. Was this additional side effect added because of an increase in undead enemies? There's only one issue I have with this hypothesis, and it's the fact that this liquid is green. Malice plays such a pivotal role in the series, and it's always tied to creatures which come back to life, so shouldn't this be red? One possibility is that it's a sort of ectoplasm, and when doing some research, apparently it was the film Ghostbusters that popularized the idea of the substance being green. Ghostbusters released in 1984. The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time released in 1998. And with that, this brings us to the end of the video. I'm going to be real for a second, this is one of my new favorite theories. What started out as a simple question of why Young Link was even allowed in the well evolved into one of the most complex and thorough projects of mine. I was seriously dreading this topic since I didn't want to just rehash old information such as the man who could see the truth theory, and I think I did a great job. I do want to thank Link, Lerulian Historian, and Chateau Lanlan since they either provided me with translations, interesting evidence, and or let me bounce some ideas off of them which led to some very interesting discussions. It's always important to remember that while you may have a big community, it doesn't make you the smartest person in the room. I do appreciate their contribution to these topics, especially the ones that aren't about Breath of the Wild. I've been Nintendo Black Crisis, and I'll see you all next time. Come on, Nintendo! Breath of the Wild 2 news, please! <laughs>